So if you weren't here the last time I was here, um, and I had the opportunity and the privilege to speak with you, um, my name is Chris. Uh, I am a youth pastor at Mississauga Family Baptist Church. Uh, yeah, my family's not here, unfortunately. Uh, the kids are asleep at home right now, didn't want to wake them up. So my wife is home with uh, the two kids, and they're taking their nap, which is very important, because if you do have kids, you know that if they don't get their naps, it's, it's terrible. <laughs> it's, it's bad. It's bad. Right? They get cranky and it's just not a good sight. Um, so this afternoon, I'm just happy to be here with all of you. And hopefully, you know, what God has sort of shared with me, hopefully I can share with you as well. And something that you guys can also um, take into heart as a challenge for what, what God has to say to us today. Um, before anything else, I'd just like to ask everybody to just bow their heads, close their eyes, and... We're just going to come to the Lord in, in a prayer. Our Father God in heaven, we thank you so much for this day and for this afternoon. Thank you, Father Lord, for just um, bringing us all here today, O oh Lord, just to come together as a family, to fellowship with one another, O oh Lord, to hear your word, O oh Lord, to be challenged, to be convicted, to be moved, to be changed, O oh Lord. Father God, whatever it is that you have in store for us today, may you just use it. Um, to, to, to move us in such a way to, to be better, to, to be better, the, the, the better versions of ourselves, O oh Lord, ones that will bring glory to your name, O oh Lord. We thank you, Father God, for just, again, this time that we have together. May you just continue to be with us in our presence. And for those who might still be on their way, uh, bring them here safely to us, O oh Lord. Uh, Father God, we love you. We pray all of these things in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, I can see around this place, it's Christmas. You see the decorations. Um, and so today it's going to be about Christmas, um, you know, in some way or another. And hopefully you can sort of follow along with me um, in that. Now, as, as Christians, as believers, as followers of Christ, I'm sure you've heard it before, but we've been challenged to be the light. Right? You've heard that sort of term. You have to be the light in this world. Um, we have that responsibility as Christians to be a light. To reflect the light of Jesus. Now, yes, it works. Uh, to be a light in this world, you know, what does that mean? And hopefully by, you know, this afternoon we'll get a little bit more indication as to what God wants us to be and how we're supposed to reflect this light that God calls us to be. Um, but when you think about what that light is supposed to do, when God calls us to be a light in this world, it it tells us that this world is in darkness, that there is a need for a light. It isn't just to simply say, I need a light in this place because for whatever reason. He's saying there is a need for a light because the world is in darkness. Now, this light that we shine, that we reflect, should essentially, if we're reflecting the same light as Christ is, it should bring hope, joy, and life to people. Right? Because that's what Christ did for us. When we see Christ's light and the light that he shines, it brings us hope. It brings salvation. It brings us joy. And so if we're supposed to reflect that same light, the same thing should happen when people see us. We should be reflecting that same light, bringing hope to people, bringing joy, and more importantly, bringing life eternal to the people that we meet. Now, you think about it, that sounds all great. That's fantastic. That's, that's, that's amazing. People should want to follow and go into this light. But as we know, even for ourselves, sometimes we don't really want to go into the light. And why is that? Right? In, in Mark 4, 22, it says, For there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should come to light. So in other words, when you look at the light, when we, obviously, when you, when you think about this place here, you turn off all the lights, it becomes very difficult for us to see absolutely anything. The moment you turn on the light, what happens? It exposes everything. It exposes the drum set, the, the drum kit, the guitar, everything. You know, the little cracks, the little, um, you know, maybe the cracks on the wall, maybe the paint peeling off. It exposes absolutely everything. And it says this, but there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed. There is nothing that we can do in darkness. Nothing that we can do behind closed doors that can hide the things from God. Right? Because of sin, we have been separated. And we know that. 
We've been separated from God and have lost ourselves in darkness. This is from the very beginning. We want more of the world and less of God, more of darkness and less of the light. And you think about what sin does. That's what it does to us. Oftentimes we don't think about sin tying us up, kind of putting us in bondage, but that's what sin does. It robs us of the ability to live in a way that pleases God. Right? I'm going to say that again. Sin robs us from the ability to live in a way that pleases God. Right? It kidnaps our desires. It distorts our thoughts and our thinking. It controls the way we speak, our tongue. It rules our behavior. It leaves us lame, it leaves us weak, it leaves us unable to do what God calls us to do. You think about it, the more you sin, sometimes it becomes more normal to you. It becomes your way of life, right? You don't even notice when you're so far into darkness that this becomes sort of your norm. It becomes who you are as a person. The things that you do, the things that you say, you're so lost in it that you don't even realize, wait a minute, I think I'm, 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 I think I'm far from God at this point. Right? But things can become so normal, you get so in far, so far so deep into darkness that you get so lost in it. And then you don't realize that you've also lost your ability to live in a way that pleases God. Right? That's what sin does. But sometimes we don't see that. But the great thing is in John 3, 18 to 21, it says the following. So John 3, 18 to 21, it says, There is no judgment against anyone who believes in Him. But... Anyone who does not believe in Him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. The judgment is based on this fact, that God's light came into this world, but people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right, they come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. Wants. And so just in that passage as well, you see that people would rather stay in darkness than go to the light to be exposed of the things that they're doing wrong. Right? Who wants to be told that, you know, this is what's wrong with you? Right? Who wants to be, you know, sort of told that these are the sins of your life and this is what's going wrong with you and why you're separated from God? Nobody likes that. Nobody really likes to be criticized. Right? To be told that, you know, you're not doing the right thing. You're like, no, you get defensive, right? And then sometimes that's the case, right? For us, when we go to God, oftentimes when we're in the wrong, when we're in sin, we're afraid to go to God because of shame. Because it kind of shows us, once we go to God, we're like, oh man, I know I'm really bad. You know, I know I'm wrong. I know I've been lying. I know I've been doing this and doing that and sort of set you in a place where it's like, man, I'm so shameful to even go to you. But God calls us to go to Him in those moments. He says, don't hide from me. Don't go into dark. Don't stay in darkness. Come to the light. Because I have something for you. I can save you from those things. Right? But too often we're afraid to go to Him because we're afraid that, well, God's going to be mad at me. Yeah, well, he's, mad. he's upset. He's not happy with our condition. But He says, I can change that. Right? I can change that. And so in this passage, we see that if we believe in Him, He says there's no judgment against us. Against us. Because God sent His Son into this world not to judge the world, but to save the world through Him. So if we believe in Him, if we have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, there is no judgment against us. For Christ is in us. So you think about it this way. When God looks at us right now, what does He see? Well, He sees me. He sees me, my sins, all of my wrongdoings. He's counting all of those things. He's saying, well, this is what Chris did. This is the things that he said. You know, the things that he's thought about, so on and so forth. But once Christ enters our life, and I come to know Christ, and His blood is shed for me, what happens? It's kind of like a blanket over me, right? When God looks at me now, He doesn't see me, He sees Christ. He says, wait a minute, I don't see Christ anymore. I see Christ there. I see Christ in His heart. I see, I, I don't see any sin. You know, it's been wiped clean through the blood of Christ. So you know what? I'm not going to count His sins no more. Right? I see who He is now in my Son. And so if we believe in Him, others should be able to see the presence of God working in us through our words, our actions, and in everything that we are. Because when you think about who Christ is, what has He done for us? Well, He's paid for our sins, for what we deserve as a result, as a result of the sin of our past, our present, and our future. Right? When He died on the cross, when He came here, He came with a purpose. 
Right? When he died on the cross, there was a purpose behind it, and that's to save us from our sins. Right? From our past, present, and future. He stood in our place so that we can be free. And that's amazing to me. Right? And so if we believe in him, if we have that relationship with him, and we really trust in his words and what he is and who he is in our lives, then people should see a reflection of Christ in our lives. Right? If we, we, we truly believe in what he's done for us and he's called us to do the same for others, to be a light, others, when they look at us, should see the same. They should see Christ. Right? And it says this, others should see that we are doing what God wants. We should be reflecting the light of Christ in our lives. Now let me ask you a question. When people look at us, do they see the characteristics of Christ? Do they see the characteristics of Christ? What is it that they see? You know, when you're in a tough circumstance, when you're in a difficult situation in life, when you're out in the parking lot and somebody kind of cuts and takes your spot, what do they see? Do they see the characteristics of Christ? And this is more so um, applicable now that it's Christmas. Because you guys are going to be going to the malls. You're going to be driving through parking lots. You know, I'm praying for you that you don't get mad at somebody when they take your spot. Or when they're in the line at the mall and you're just getting so frustrated because it's so crowded. Right? It's, you know, it's that time of year where it gets really busy. Especially in the malls. Right? So what do people see when they look at you? Do they see the characteristics of God? Do people see the evidence of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives as Christians? Do they see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control in the way we live? Now I'm going to tell you a story. There was a story that I, I, I found on the internet and I was reading through this article. And it, it's apparently true or based on a true sort of um, circumstance. It's about a mother and a daughter. Um, the mother's name is Florence. The daughter's name is Melody. And Florence, the mother, uh, mother had gone to the same hairdresser for years. Now, I don't go to a hairdresser, you know, there's a barber down in Melton that I go to quick, you know, I'll just go in there and get, it, get my hair cut. For women, I know you have specific hairdressers. If you don't go to the same hairdresser, you get angry, right?